a cunning stunt. Bound in bed and blindfolded, I hear the man of words come to me. Burying his face between my thighs, he says, a cunt by any other name would smell as complicated. And then, sniffling in Sanskrit, he crystals it, yoni, the womb, uterus, vulva, vagina, the female organs of generation. Memory gives way to medical terminology, gives way to metaphor, as this man turns to a word monster who says that it connotes place of birth, source, origin, spring, fountain. And with his first thrust, it also becomes a place of rest, repository, and the receptacle to his erection, enormous as the Monia Williams Dictionary. He's staring away to make the meanings fit in and cunt now becomes seat, abode, home, liar, nest, stable and he opens my legs wider and shoves more and shoves harder and I'm torn apart to contain the meanings of family, race, stock and caste and form of existence and station fixed by birth and I can take it no more. Pinned down that way, I cannot walk away. I'm frightened, I'm frigid. I turn faker. Uh, the second poem is uh, called uh, Backstreet Girls and uh, it's dedicated to the moral police because where I come from it's very easy to judge people and especially if you're women and you're writing you know people call you all kinds of names and they diagnose you with all kinds of problems so it's a little background. Backstreet Girls. This woman, she's the slut, and that girl over there, she's the glutton. And I'm a bitch with tattoos on my lusty thighs. This dark lady has storm in her speech, that one strikes gold as part-time witch. And I'm a shrew with summers in my name. Tongues untied, we swallow sons. Sure as sluts, we strip random men. Sleepless, there is stardust on our lids. Naked, they self-love on our minds. And yes, my dears, we are all friends. There will be no blood on our bridal beds. We are not the ones you will choose for wives. We are not the ones you can sentence for life. Mulligotany dreams. Anaconda, candy, cash, catamaran. Cherut, coolie, corundum, curry, ginger, mango, mulligatani. Pacholi, papadam, rice, tati, teak, vetiver. I dream of an English full of the words of my language. An English in small letters, an English that shall tire a white man's tongue, an English where small children practice with smooth round pebbles in their mouth to spell the right ra. An English where a pregnant woman is stomach child lady. An English where the magic of black eyes and brown bodies replaces the glamour of ice and dishwater blue shades and the airbrush romance of pink, white, cherry blossom skins. An English where love means only the strange frenzy between a man and his beloved and not between him and his car. An English without the privacy of its many rooms. An English with suffixes for respect. An English with more than 36 words to call the sea. An English that doesn't be little, brown or black, men or women. An English of tasting with five fingers. An English of talking love with eyes alone. And I dream of an English where men of that spiky, crunchy tongue buy flower garlands of jasmine to bring home to their coy wives for the silent demand of a night of wordless whispered love. Nailed. Men are afraid of any woman who makes poetry and dangerous portents, unable to predict when, for what and for whom she will open her mouth, unable to stitch up her lips, they silence her. Her pet parrot developed an atrocious fetish for the flesh of sacrificial goats, so Kulamai was bolted within a box and dropped in the Kaveri. She teased and tormented his celibacy, so Miss Success Village was thrown into a well by a wandering socialite godman. She was inaccessible and unattainable, so Durga was put in an iron trunk that settled on a riverbed and even the men and women who tried to approach her were informed in a pre-recorded voice that she was out of reach and network coverage. 
She was an outcast who had all the marks of a fiery orator who would someday run for parliament. So a nail was driven into her head on the instructions of her Brahmin fiancé and her coffin was set adrift in a wailing river. She was black and bloodthirsty, so even Kali found herself shut inside her shrine. They were relatively low risk, so most other women were locked up at home. Lady Justice you are sad and you start out sluggishly, shedding your gypsy skirts and learning to dress up in gold and Valentino gowns. You are playing patience to pass the time and you believe every feud has to die out when the fighters die. You wait for that. You later learn it does not work that way. Sitting still in a songless court, you watch backlogs and bribes and middlemen grow. You're unfazed by all the hard work that sob stories demand and so you dictate your judgments by picking out from a tarot deck. You give the ten of swords to the woman paraded naked and to the gang raped girl. Self-defeating, dangerous if they ever won. The five of pentacles to a labourer duped of her lifetime savings and that old trader who wears his losses like a brass talisman. Finally, you hand out the three of swords for a habeas corpus from a modeling ex-king looking for his kidnapped princess bride. Your courtroom turns into an ominous circus, two shows every day entry free and as the high priestess, you let hope elope with justice. The rebellious riotists unite against you, you are handed a hanged man and based in bullets. Your sinuous body is cast in stone and to make sure you never turn blind or bored or fall asleep, each plaintiff applies a paste of blood red chilies on your open eyes. Uh, I just want to add that this is actually a goddess in India and uh, where people make prayers and because the god shouldn't be blind and they want her to actually take some action, they apply the paste of dried chili on the goddess statues on the eyes. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a remaking of a, of a folk practice that still exists, yeah. Lines addressed to a warrior. Come, colonize me. Creep into the hollows of my landscape. My eyes click lock. No more the drawing of the gates. Set up your home, your office, the writing desk and the trading post. Ignore the sand brown of my skin. A willing blind, I will never know black from white. Take me and talk of your finer finish. Stand I yield, so script your stories here. Invade this inner space, adjust the pace and pulse of your marching armies and house your machine guns, its manuals. Populate me with anthems, the songs of wrath and those of war. Draft words that echo of gunfire to accompany my lone dance of submission. Though prose mad and power crazy, you conquer me never with malice or manhood. Capture every territory, fill up all my blank skin to resound with the strike of scimitars, the sadness of success. Have all your battles lost to one, chronicled across my line of town. Touch. Have you ever tried meditation, struggling hard to concentrate and keeping your mind as blank as a whitewashed wall by closing your eyes, nose, ears and shutting out every possible thought, everything and the only failure that ever came, the only gross betrayal was from your own skin. You will have known that. Do you still remember how the first temptations arose and you blamed skin as a sinner, how when your kundalini was rising, shaken you felt the cold concrete floor, skin rubbing against skin, your saffron robes, how even in a far off different realm, your skin anchored you to this earth. Amidst all that pervading emptiness, touch retained its sensuality. You will have known this. Or if you thought more variedly about taste, you would discount it as the touch of the tongue. Or you may recollect how a gentle touch, a caress changed your life multifold and you were never the person you should have been. Feeling with your skin was perhaps the first of the senses. Its reality always remained with you. You never got rid of this. You will have also known this. 
you will have known almost every knowledgeable thing about the charms and the temptations that touch could hold, but you will never have known that touch, the taboo to your transcendence, when crystallized and cast, was a paraphernalia of undeserving hate. Uh, this poem is called Mohandas Karamchan, which is the first name of the person popularly called Gandhi. So, Mohandas Karamchan, this uh, poem is written when I was 17. I had just read Celia Plath's Daddy, and uh, it was a poem about the father figure. So, for me, the, the father figure who was the one who most upset me was, of course, the father of uh, India, which is uh, Gandhi's considered the father of the nation. So, yeah. And it starts with a quote from Albert Einstein, who said of Gandhi, Generations to come will scarcely believe that such a one as this walked the earth in flesh and blood. Who, 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 Mahatma, sorry, no. Truth, non-violence, stop it, enough taboo. That trash is long overdue. You need a thorough review. Your tax-free soul stimulated our wounds. We gonna sue you, the Congress shoe. Gone half cuckoo, you called us names. You dubbed us pariahs, harijans. Goody, goody, guys of a bigot god. Ram, Ram, hey, Ram, boo. Don't ever act like a holy saint. We can see through you, impure you. Remember how you dealt with your poor wife. But they they wrote your books, they made your life. They stuffed you up the imposter true and saw you up, filled you with virtue and gave you all those glossy deeds. Enough reason we still lick you. You knew, you bloody well knew. Cast wouldn't go, they wouldn't let it go. It haunts us now the way you do with a spooky stick, a eerie laugh or two. But they killed you, the naked you, your blood with mud was gooey goo. Saddest fool, you killed your body many times before this too. Bapu, Bapu, you big fraud, we hate you. And perhaps because we only met in secret and shielded by darkness, he hesitates whenever I ask him to bring our love to light.